Good evening, folks. So good to be here with you. I don't know what your day was like today, but we had a full day. Uh, we are having our youth uh, annual fundraiser out there on the byways and highways of our province here in Alberta, central Alberta, cleaning up some of the mess that has been left over over the course of the winter. So that was a long day of that. And then uh, here we are together as we come to uh, Psalm 119 for the final time in the sermon series, The Path to Life. Thank you for having me in your places. And as we close this series off, I hope you've had the opportunity to uh, look through this material, look through Psalm 119 especially, 119 especially, and I hope you've been blessed by it. So I want to begin by going back to the year 2006. The, the place somewhere on the 6,000 acre training camp area of Camp Borden, Ontario. The task to success, successfully complete, pardon me, a night navigation exercise. One more check in the box to complete the basic chaplain officer's course. Equipment required, map of training area of course, compass, night vision light, water bottle and a good pair of boots. In order to complete the night navigation, the candidate was required to navigate uh, through the dense forest at night through a set course on the map. The candidate was to find each waypoint, shoot a new bearing to the next waypoint until the course was completed. One more item to mention, it was expected that the candidate would complete said exercise within a certain time limit. So with all this in mind and with enthusiasm, said candidate began the task at hand and for all intensive purposes was on track to complete the task within the required time allotted with time to spare. That is until Murphy showed up and Murphy showed up when the candidate was advised by a superior that they had made a mistake in their calculations. Now unbeknownst to said superior, this was not the candidate's first rodeo when it came to map and compass and the candidate was positive they were on the correct course. Well, Murphy, that is, said superior, wouldn't let it go and the candidate submitted. And away they went, further and further into the training area. And it was upon discovering a certain road that the candidate came to realize that they were so far off course that they could say, in a technical sense, they were lost. Of course, the candidate, candidate was not very happy with their superior because this would mean a failure on this required task. Long story short, the candidate, candidate taking things into hand found their way back to the encampment. Upon an arriving, was berated for their failure. Lessons learned. Listen to your superior and then proceed to do what is right anyway. One degree off a compass bearing can get you lost very quickly. Murphy can show up in many different ways, means, and times. Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 119, verse 169 to 176. Verse 169. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. Let your right hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the time that we spent beginning at verse 1. Now we're coming to the very end of this sermon and the end of the sermon series. But more importantly, the time that we spent in this wonderful word of God, this psalmist portraying and leaving us an example of a godly servant faithfully following you, O Lord. And may we be known for that as well in our lives. And thank you, and may you be glorified as we spend some time in this text. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, amen. 
So as we unpack the text before us, uh, we, are, we will have completed at the end of our time what I believe is of more important eternal significance when compared to, say, that navigation exercise in Camp Borden, that check in the box. You know, when we began our journey through Psalm 119, we were, we were immediately drawn into the personal experience of a faithful, God, a faithful servant of God from long days gone by. As, as observers, we have witnessed a godly servant faced, facing his trials and tribulations, the lies and slander from, for his faith in God and his trust and obedience to the word of God. We have witnessed a faithful God uh, coming near to his servant, the nearness of God coming alongside the holy word, his holy word bringing life and hope in a place much darker than wandering in a forest saying to yourself, how did I miss that? The servant of God here today expressing a dark night of the soul in his prayer. A lament that was recorded for us in the word of God in 176 verses. And today in our text, the psalmist continued his lament as he prayed, Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Verse 169a. The psalmist, as one commentator put it, quote, prays with a broken spirit. Now, if you were with me last week, or if you heard last week's message, we said that in the midst of the psalmist's lament, it seemed that the tone had changed. Yes, the trouble remained. The adversaries continued their accusations. Yet, it seemed the psalmist remained hopeful and even joyful as he had put his trust in God and his word. He even said, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. That was in verse 162. He would go on to say, Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. And great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. That was verse 164 and 165. So we wonder here, what exactly is happening here? Happening here? Is it a broken spirit or, or a rejoicing? It might seem to you uh, that there's a contradiction here. It might seem to us that there's a contradiction here. What we need to do is we need to hang on to our hats because there'll be more to follow. Let's be patient. Let's go back to the ta ta text. The psalmist in his cry prayed that God would give me understanding according to your, wor your word. Verse 169b. We ask, of course, questions about this. We ask what? Understanding of what? Well, understanding of his circumstances. That's what he was looking for. The persecution, the, the false accusations, all the trials, troubles, etc. And then we need to notice here where he was looking for God's understanding. Did he go to the uh, self-help uh, place in the library? You know, all self-help help, help books and manuals? Where did he go to look for God's understanding? Well, he, he told us, he told us here in verse 169, according to your word, your word, 169b. Now we want to pause for a second as we ponder that. Let me ask you, when you find yourself in the middle of a spiritual challenge, in the middle of a, a difficult circumstance, where do you go for understanding? Of course, you can go to your pastor, and I would encourage you to go to your pastor for help. That's what they're there for. You go to your spouse, your favorite uncle, your wise uncle, your cousin, your brothers and sisters, siblings. You can go to your brothers or sisters in the faith for help. You can go to a doctor, a, a, a dentist, a therapist. Yes, those are all okay places. But let me ask you this question. Where did the psalmist turn for understanding in his dark night of the soul? Ponder that question. Earlier in his prayer, he asked a different question. The psalmist did. A really good question. He said, how can a young man keep his way pure? Let's just drop young man. How can you and I keep our way pure? Or let's put this. How can the psalmist keep his way pure? Where did he find the answer to that question in his prayer? He said, by guarding it according to your word. Verse 9. And again, the psalmist, even in his trials, uh, earlier in his prayer, desiring to keep the commandments of God, said this, Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Verse 34, that heart, that, 
the very soul of the, of the psalmist, where his desires and, and his, his, his desires and everything that that psalmist represented, the person. He wanted to keep the law. He wanted to observe it with his whole person. So where did the psalmist turn for understanding? Well, the word of God. You know, maybe, just maybe, we should be like the psalmist and pray to God for understanding, as he did, through the lens of the Word of God. You know, often the very first place we go is to Google or a self-help book or some self-proclaimed expert. Or there's other places that I mentioned, which is fine to go to your pastor or family and friends or those that support you. But maybe you go to Google first or you go to your, on your social media page and find some, some expert there. And this is what we often do, do we not? Friends, if you are a Christian, born again, spirit-filled, the word of God and prayer is more than just essential to you and me. It is our very lifeline. And the psalmist gives us an example of how important the word of God and prayer was for his situation when he said, let my plea come before you, deliver me according to your word. Verse 170. Here we have prayer and scripture together in the psalmist's plea. And we can also, we could just change that word plea to supplication. That's another way that's translated. He was praying for deliverance of his situation. Here is a model, my friends, for you and me and how to respond in a godly manner in our times of trial, whatever they may be. We can go to the Apostle Peter. In his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 2, he reminded the Christian exiles that he was writing the letter to that in their suffering for their good deeds, that Jesus also suffered for them. The apostle Peter went on to say about Jesus, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to who judges justly. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. Where did, where did he turn to? To his father. In verse 19, just before this, Peter reminded them, these Christian exiles in their trials, for this is a gracious thing, that when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. So let me ask you again, where do you turn to get understanding? In your sorrow. You see, the psalmist went to his knees in prayer with the word of God in hand. And it was from this posture of seeking understanding by prayer and the word of God, the psalmist would be able to endure and to express a thankful and joyful heart that God would keep his promises. The psalmist's redemption was on its way. For he said, my lips pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. And that's also translated righteous. All your commandments are righteous. Verse 171 to 172. We flip over, go back earlier in history to first chapter, chapter one, uh, 1 Samuel, pardon me, chapter 23. And there we find the king of Israel at the time, Saul, pursuing David in the wilderness of Judah to take him out, to kill him. And David, in this time of trouble, prayed this, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, and my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is not water. Psalm 63, verse 1. Now, can you hear David's lament, his plea, his supplication to God for deliverance? So we can ask, where did David go for understanding of a situation? Where did he go? Well, David said, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. You see, David prayed to God, and the results speak for itself. For David said, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So as long as I live in your name, I will lift up my hands. Psalm 63, verse 3 and 4. We go to the New Testament era. 
Apostle Paul writing to the believers in Philippi, Philippi there in chapter 3, uh, chapter 2, or 3, I can't remember exactly where, lists his Jewish pedigree. He said things like, well, he was uh, 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 born, uh, you know, from the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. You know, as for the law, he had zeal. He persecuted the church. All this before his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, we find in Acts chapter 8. Then he said this, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Philippians chapter 3, and you'll find the context there, verse 1 to 11. And that word rubbish, just in case you know, is the translation for the word, well, we'll just put it this way, dung. I'll let you figure that out. So our psalmist, King David, Apostle Paul, had one goal in mind, even in their most difficult times. And I'll let Paul explain it in his way. Paul said, Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straying forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Let's go back to our text. We take Psalm 1, we take verse, pardon me, verse 173 and 175 together. We find the psalmist here repeated the theme we found from verse 169 to 172. Let, me, let us read uh, 173 to 175 together again. Verse 173, let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you and let your rules help me. The psalmist continued here in his prayer to demonstrate his commitment to the word of God despite his circumstances. For I have chosen your precepts, he said, verse 173b. Your law is my delight, 174b. And let your rules or your just decrees help me, verse 175b. And because of his commitment to submit himself to the word of God, the psalmist had grounded himself and received the anticipation that God's powerful hand, verse 173, would deliver him from his trials. He received the hope that God would do that. We go back again to another place, another time. The 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, we find there recorded for us the song of Moses. A song that Moses sang. The book of Deuteronomy, often referred to as Moses' last will and testament, and Moses, towards the end of that book, uh, sings this song. That faithful servant of God, uh, Deuteronomy describes in 34 or 10, whom the Lord knew face to face. He would sing his last song. And Moses sang, For the Lord will vindicate his people and have compassion on his servants when he sees that their power is gone and there's nothing, none remaining, bond or free. Deuteronomy 32, 36. My friends, the compassion of God, the mercy of God had come to the psalmist as it had for Moses and for King David and the Apostle Paul and all the Old Testament saints and New Testament saints up to this day. And it's there where you and me, when trouble comes, our way. When we are in the dark night of the soul, when it seems that God is far away, when we are falsely accused, when like the psalmist we cry out before the Lord for deliverance, my dear friends, God is not far away from you, for he loves his people. He has compassion and mercy. God is nearer to you than your arms are to your side. And in Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul gives us a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful picture of this. When he said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life 
nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. Write that down. Read it over and over. Well, with this all in mind, we have arrived after a seven-month journey to the very final verse of 119. The psalmist said, I have gone astray for... Pardon me, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. Verse 176. Remember earlier we pondered together what exactly was happening here in this particular stanza? Is this a broken spirit or is this a rejoicing? After all the psalmist did include in his prayer, in verse 168 he said, I keep your precepts and testimonies, for all my ways are before you. And now he prays, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant. Is this then a contradiction? Well, let's appeal to another preacher, uh, a most excellent preacher from another time. Charles Spurgeon, when preaching on Psalm 19, addresses this apparent incongruity between 168 and 176. And Spurgeon said this of these two verses, quote, They form a paradox, and they both are true, true of the same man at the same time. Oxford Dictionary defines paradox in this way, quote, a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory statement or proposition that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded and true. So let's investigate this ever so briefly, this seemingly contradiction in Psalm 119. It has already been noted that verse 169 to 171, the psalmist continued to pray a prayer of supplication to God for deliverance for his afflictions. We also discovered that he prayed for understanding of his situation, and he expected to find the needed understanding from the word of God. And as a result of his supplication, he discovered a growing anticipation that God would deliver on his promises found in his word. And this in itself resulted in a joyful expression of thanksgiving. And we see this motif, this theme repeated again from verse 172 to 175. We also know the psalmist had already prayed in similar ways here at verse 170, as he did here at 176. Back in verse 10, 11, he prayed, With my whole heart I seek you, let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Well, as we take all this in, The biblical evidence is very strong here that Spurgeon was right in his interpretation of this situation. This is a form of a paradox, and both are true for our psalmist at the same time. The psalmist was assured that God, that the God he served, knew all his ways, and at the same time prayed that God would find him. His trials and troubles had made him feel like a lost sheep, like a lost lamb. And is this not the tension we often feel when in the midst of our trials? We know that God knows and is nearby, but it doesn't feel like it. And like the psalmist, we pray for deliverance from the trial. And sometimes we, like the psalmist, cry out for it feels like we lost our way. As we draw this close, I often don't like to use myself as an example or talk too much about myself from the pulpit. I'm not interested in drawing attention to myself. But this has been a very powerful time through this Psalm 119. As I was meditating on this particular stanza, I was reminded of some of the trials in my own life that I had gone through that I felt like that guy deep in the 6,000 acre forest at night of Camp Borden trying to find his way back to the encampment. Back to a safe place in a warm sleeping bag. And as I look back over those trials, not that one, but more difficult trials, more often not the very thing I needed to do, I didn't do until I was deep into the forest. And that was to pray and meditate on the Word of God. My friends, when we find ourselves deep in the forest, we need to pray and we need to meditate on the Word of God and plead and and supplication that God would help us in those times. You see, the prayer and the, and the Word of God is a Christian's lifeline. 
So over the days and weeks of praying and meditating on Psalm 118, I was reminded over and over again that no matter what happens in my life, the most precious gift that God has given me, His very own Holy Spirit. And in the trials and challenges that come my way, God comes alongside His Holy Word. And in my prayer for deliverance, the blessed assurance of God's Word is that all His promises are yes in Jesus Christ. Right there in the sorrow in that hard place, words that taste like honey come to me from the Word of God. And it might be a paradox, yet joy returns. Hope is present, and I know that one day in God's sovereign will and purpose, it will all be made right. It will all be made right, my friends. I need to ask you. I hope you or maybe just started watching it right now at the end of this message. Do you know the love of Christ? Have you experienced that assurance that in the night and in the trial and in the, the troubles that you know, that you know, that you know that God knows and he's there with you? If you have not received Christ, if you have not known the love of Christ, my dear friend, you have more trouble than being lost in a forest. And God today is asking, looking, just like Jesus talks about that shepherd that left the 99 sheep to go for that one lost sheep. He's looking for that lost sheep. And if you're that lost sheep, this is a time for you to repent and turn and receive the love of Christ. If you are a Christian and you are in the dark night of your soul, dear ones, I don't know how else I could say it to you. You are not alone. God is with you. Right there. You might not feel it. You might not understand. But pray. Read the word of God. And one day, it will all be made right. Maybe not now. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe only after Jesus comes. But it will be made right. Your hope is not in this life. Your hope is in the next to come. And the promises of Jesus, the promises of God, as I said, are yes in Christ. Let us pray. Dear Father, I thank you. And I pray for my friends. I, I hope that someone got to the end. I hope even that someone just started at the end of this message, Lord. And they heard of the great love that you have for this world. Because you sent your only son and that he would die and for the sins of the world. And Lord, I thank you for all those things. And I pray for my friends. They would hear this and receive it. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Thanks, folks. God bless. See you soon. Shalom.